So I have a slide on um, explaining why we're focusing on cities, but I feel like this has been covered quite a few times already today, and I'm quite tempted to just ask people to just look out of the window at Euston Road, which I think covers a lot of these things quite nicely, actually. That essentially the issue is that cities bring together a large amount of different issues in a highly con concentrated way. So we have economic activity, greenhouse gas emissions, environmental risks, um, health risks, but we also have this large opportunity to change things. Um, and there's, a, there's quite a large potential for city level decision making. And that was quite encouraging in the wake of the US's um, decision to pull out of the Paris Agreement, the way that city mayors tended to step in to fill the place. So the, the project I'm going to talk about briefly is called SHU. SHU stands for Sustainable Healthy Urban Environments. It's led by LSHTM. Uh, PI is uh, Paul Wilkinson and has partners at UCL uh, in Salvador in Brazil and in Delhi. And it's funded through the Wellcome Trust, Our Planet, Our Health initiative, which Saskia talked about earlier. Um, the aim of the project is to build a globally distributed database of cities with the aim of identifying the interrelationship between city characteristics, the use of energy and resources, and health-related behaviours and exposures. So what we're trying to do is to understand some of the challenges in cities and how, by, and how we might be able to deal with them and better understand them by bringing together um, data from a wide variety of sources. <coughs> So this SHU database consists of data on 246 randomly selected cities and a further 63 cities that were chosen for some reason of interest. So it's 390 total. Um, we've defined a city quite broadly as any urban area with a population of greater than 15,000 people. Um, this, this, the random sample was stratified by national wealth population size and eco-region, so we're trying to get something that is broadly speaking globally representative and at least represents, for example, smaller cities more than uh, tends to happen in other initiatives. And then the idea is that we could use this data for um, context setting comparisons. So we can make comparative analyses, city to city comparisons, we can try and understand a bit more about the drivers and the solutions to problems and investigate um, the best way to work out these solutions um, using um, health impact modeling tools. So I've just got two brief examples of the type of data we've collecting and how we've been bringing it together. So these are um, temperature increases in shoe cities by the end of this century under the high emissions RCP 8.5 scenario. Um, so on the y-axis, you've got this increase in mean temperature in the hottest month. So this is the hottest month of the year, by the end of the century, but it's not the maximum temperature during the day. It's the average of average temperatures over the month. So what's interesting here, and as plotted on the x-axis, is, is latitude. So you can see straight away there's quite a clear relationship between um, latitude and um, the experience of climate change in different cities. There's going to be quite substantial variation in different cities. It's worth noticing, for example, that I've grouped the cities here today um, by their eco-region. And you can see that the cities towards the top are predominantly drier and humid temperate cities. And for example, if you look at somewhere like Madrid, their average temperature in the hottest month will be seven degrees warmer than it is already. And in some of these cities, that takes their average daily temperature, not the maximum temperature, the average daily temperature in the hottest month will be above 40 degrees. There's another example. This is a plot of shoe cities showing their level of air pollution uh, plotted against their wealth. Um, so on the y-axis we have the av annual average PM2.5, so those are fine particles that penetrate quite deeply down into the lungs. And on the x-axis we've got the, an estimate uh, that we pull together of their GDP from different sources. And what you can see again quite clearly 
is that it's beneficial for air pollution to, to live in a wealthy city. But within that, there are huge variations in air pollution concentrations, even at different levels of GDP, which obviously tells us there are a lot more drivers. So what we're hoping to do is to layer on top of this other information about city size, city density, and um, the proximity to other local emission sources to work out how we can better understand what cities should be doing to deal with air pollution. It's also worth noticing that the red line represents the WHO's guideline for ambient air pollution of 10 micrograms per cubic metre, and nearly all the cities are way above that level. On, I guess on, on the positive spin, you could say that means we've got something to aim for, and there are large opportunities for public health if we can do something about this. So that's a little flavour of the type of data that we're collecting. The, the downside is that there are some fairly large limitations of the currently available data. So this map shows um, a, a, a heat map of uh, population centres in the world. So this is no longer the shoe cities, this is population in the whole world. Um, and all cities are greater than 15,000 people. So you can see what you'd expect, large population centres in Europe, um, Central Europe, India and uh, China, Japan. The next plot shows us where the data comes from. So these are, these are the kind of um, large key databases that we've been accessing data through. So obviously the, the more red that's um, where there's more data for cities. And you can see the map is completely different. This is the population map, just for comparison. And it's immediately clear that large areas of the world have almost no data, and too much data is concentrated in Europe. It's particularly interesting to note how underrepresented Africa and Asia, especially um, Central Asia, And similarly, this is a map of cities that are members of um, key international sustainability organisations, a bit like um, C40 that we were hearing about earlier. And again, it's heavily weighted towards Europe and um, Africa and Asia are uh, particularly underrepresented. So the danger is that we'll have too much data on cities that are engaged and keen to be involved in these sorts of processes, but we don't know enough about um, other parts of the world. So to summarise, the SHU project is compiling a database to derive comparative information on a globally representative sample of cities. Um, and our aim is that the database is helping to inform research and policy questions aimed at reducing vulnerabilities to environmental hazards and the needs of, and opportunities of sustainable de development. As I've shown briefly, there are already large amounts of data available, but there are considerable limitations. And a particularly key limitation is the inconsistent coverage of data, but there are many more. Thank you very much.